Hello there, welcome to my garden. My name is Ed Johnson and it's my turn today to show you my garden, which is a little different than the suburban gardens that we have been videotaping before. I live on two acres and I farm this quarter acre here and uh, for, for the last 20 years. I used to have just a rototilled field here and grow things everywhere. Then I decided to go to raised beds because it was easier to manage the weeds and uh, the soil and everything. So I have about 15 raised beds here and I've got some trees coming up everywhere and fruit trees on the property too. So I'll show you all of that. And uh, Janet is going to be handling the camera. So um, we'll see how all that goes and hope you enjoy it. These are my uh, two pawpaw plants and uh, I bought them as little things like this and they're about two years old now. They even flowered this year but they're probably still too young to set any fruit. Um, and the pawpaw plant is, um, let me quote from um, Diana Bresford book about the pawpaw and she says uh, it is one of the most important trees of Canada yet few have heard this species let alone see it. The pawpaw has other siblings in the tropics, some in Central America or Brazil. <clears throat> and I've got the other kind too in my other greenhouse, which I'll show you. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, green, heart-shaped green fruit, whose custard filling tastes heavenly like a mixture of pineapple with mango and bananas. And uh, that's what it tastes like. But it's known only to raccoons, possums, and many other four-legged animals because it doesn't ship well. So you have to ripen it on the tree and then eat it within a day. And um, so it's a very uh, neat uh, little tree and, and it really is quite green. And so I'm waiting for, I don't know how many years it'll take to set fruit, but uh, hopefully soon. Okay, this is my onion patch, and uh, I have on this side a fortress onion, uh, which is a hybrid, so you cannot save seeds from it. It won't uh, germinate true. But on this side are Walla Walla onions, which you can save seed from. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, you can pick it when it's small and it gets bigger and bigger, so you'll have onions from now, uh, you know, May until um, they get really big. And uh, saving the seeds, um, I've read that um, onion seeds do not save very well, so you have to keep them in the freezer. So if you keep them in the freezer over winter and plant them again, I haven't done that and they've still been good, but just to be on the safe side, that's probably what you should do. Um, so, so, yeah, so these uh, onions, these fortress onions, which are hybrids, um, you have to grow from seed to make uh, storage onions. Uh, we're just eating the last ones now from last year. So we've managed to have our own onions year round. And uh, so I think that's pretty remarkable and we'll have even more onions this year. And when did you start the, the seeds at? The seeds were probably started in December or January and I set them out in uh, February or March. I set them out in January, Bill Morgan told me to set them out in January one year and it snowed and flattened them all down and I had to start all over again and kill them. So I wait a little longer now and they sit there for a while, for a month anyway, before they do anything. So um, if you, um, I've had them indoors about a month and then outdoors for another month before they start to show signs of life. This is uh, my elderberry tree and um, I, uh, grew that from seed and it was a little runt of a thing the first year and the second year it got up about this high and started to spread everywhere so I thought it just gets in my way I'll just cut it right down to about this far from the base and if it lives fine if it doesn't okay because last year we couldn't um, harvest the flower or harvest the fruit on them because the flowers it was I guess I think we had a, a bad uh, fall and it wasn't warm enough and so not all of the uh, fruit ripens because they go from light blue to black on this one. So I cut it all down and this year it just went boom right up there and it's really early now for flowers than it was last year so I'm pretty sure I'll get a good, uh, um, you want to show the flowers up there? Sure. So, and what are you going to use it for it? Well elderberry is good for cold so you make a syrup out of it or a tincture or something like that. Um, I haven't done it yet, so it'll be a new experiment for me. I'm always experimenting with something around here. Not wine? 
Uh, flowers, yeah, could. Could if I have lots of flowers. Last year I didn't want to pick the flowers because I didn't know what the fruit was going to okay. do. These are my kohlrabi uh, plants that I started from seed and I stuck them out here and everything was looking fine until I came out one day and one of them had almost all the leaves laying down on the ground beside it. So I suspected birds uh, because they do go after the lettuce around here. So I put these cages around here and these cages came from the dollar store and they are actually waste baskets and they were about a dollar a piece, dollar and a quarter. I thought, what a deal. And I use them all the time now when things are starting up to keep the birds off, off things. So that's worked out really well. And I've got a big um, patch of purslane right here. Most people will call this a weed, but it is actually a good salad plant and it doesn't taste bad either. I mean, it tastes good really. I've got another little um, elderberry here it's a different variety and it's already flowering. I bought it as a bush uh, last year, so I don't know how big it's going to get. Where is my notes on this one? Let's see. Don't have any. Okay, this is a sour cherry tree that we also planted as a young little tree and it's done really well. And last year we got some sour cherries on it and I had a little fence around it to keep the raccoons off and it worked okay. This year the fence was getting in the way so I just took the fence away and and uh, th everything was looking really well till I came out here two days ago and it looked like there was a big open area in the tree and I looked really closely and there's a branch that's practically broken off and a raccoon got up here and they go out to the edge end of the limbs like that and break them off. They're really terrible for cherry trees. So the solution for the last two nights has been I have a uh, electric uh, fence uh, zapper that they use around cows and horses and stuff. And I put some bare wire around, around near the bottom and bare wire about a foot higher and hook the two terminals to that. And so I haven't had a problem with them. They could jump up or grab some, some other way, but hopefully that scares them off and they won't come back because I don't want to put a fence around this thing again, or I don't want to cover it with a big net. The birds get some, but they're not a big problem. So it looks like, Janet, you're going to make lots of uh, cherry yes, pie this year. Much, and I'm glad I didn't run over there and grab some off the bush and get electrocuted. <laughs> yeah, I've got it unplugged. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, this is my tomato patch, and these are all early girls on uh, and they're outside and they're mostly still green. I planted some inside in the greenhouse and I'm picking tomatoes off of them already. And uh, it isn't even July 1st yet. I do have some bindweed coming up everywhere. But uh, what I wanted to show about this was, you know, some people uh, clip the uh, little axles off to keep these plants uh, sh from going out like this and which is a good idea for these plants because they're quite rangy. Um, but um, actually, um, Ann Friedank told me about this. You take one of those things off and maybe it's a big one about like this. Cut it off, stick it in the ground and uh, give it some water and look what happened. Another one started, got another one started right here. Um, it probably won't do anything this year, but it's something interesting because these are quite uh, quite hardy plants. Okay, this is my asparagus patch, uh, having uh, going to seed now and flowering. Uh, we had a lot of asparagus off of it this year, and uh, it's a pretty old bed. It must be 10 years old, and uh, uh, it keeps coming up every year. And I, I have to uh, corral the thing and even trim it with a hedge trimmer to keep it so I can get in between the beds. It's just... Uh, ferocious. Last year, and uh, so last year I read somewhere that uh, you don't want the uh, little red berries to uh, to stay on the plant because some are male and some are female I take it. So I went in here and I chopped up all the red ones I could find and thought good got that taken care of until the spring of this year and in the next bed down there which if you follow me over here these came up and they were, I assume they were pollinated by the wind and uh, I left them because who doesn't like asparagus and so if it's finding its own place where it likes then 
so be it. That's the way I like to garden anyway. And uh, so I didn't pick any on, on it this year, just let it uh, go up and take take uh, care. So I think that uh, George uh, having his in a pot near the lawn won't have that problem because this thing, the seeds seem to only germinate in, in uh, bare ground. So, but it really is a, a great plant, comes up every year, give it a little water, give it a little fertilizer, and uh, once you get it started, it's great. And they're good for raised beds because uh, you don't want them sitting in uh, water, so they drain really well. If you can see this right here, this is a, a Gary oak tree that came up on its own. I guess a bird deposited the seeds in, in the uh, raised bed, and so I thought, great, left it. So when it gets bigger, I'll have a shady area. I can grow uh, cabbages or things that don't want a lot of sun. So that's uh, another way I like to garden, is to let things do what they want to do. I respect volunteers too. They belong there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is my French tarragon plant, and it started out as a little little thing that I bought from the nursery for $4 or something like that. Stuck it in there. Last year it did a little. This year, whew, it really took off and it has a licorice flavor to it. And you, uh, like there's so much French tarragon, I could open up a French tarragon factory. There's so much of it this year. So uh, quite happy about that, it really took off well. I'm letting some lettuce here go to seed and uh, because I like this variety and I'll probably only leave one of them here and throw the rest in the compost. But what I found out about lettuce, if you just let them go to seed, and the wind blows, they'll come up everywhere, which some have. But if you want them in a certain place and you notice the seeds are ripe, just break off the seed head and lay it on the ground right by where you want it or move it wherever you want it. And uh, next spring, after the rain, you'll start seeing little lettuce plants coming up and you can thin them out and, and to have the earliest lettuce uh, possible because uh, it knows when to germinate. In this bed, I've uh, got uh, cilantro, and uh, every year that I've grown it, it comes up about this high and in bolts, and you get about three or four leaves, and it's just, uh, you go to the store and you buy a whole handful for a couple dollars, and it doesn't seem worth growing. This year, because we had a very cloudy springtime, uh, they didn't bolt right away, they're just starting to now, but they've got millions of leaves on them, so I think the uh, solution here is to grow them in the shade and uh, you'll have uh, cilantro uh, a lot longer. And you let them go to seed as well, and they will come up little babies around here as well. So it's another plant that's uh, easy to grow, and if you like cilantro, uh, it's a coriander, the seed, and uh, it has a different name, but uh, you can use either one in cooking. Now this netting uh, is to keep the cabbage moth uh, away from uh, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and uh, things like that. And I grew some Chinese cabbage because uh, my friend likes to make kimchi and she always talks about Chinese cabbage. So I got some seeds and it shows a nice little head of cabbage, very tight head like that. So I planted them here in the early spring. I think I started them in March in seeds. And uh, they came up all right, and they were just big and beautiful, but they didn't form a head. They were just lots of leaves, and then they uh, bolted. So last week said, okay, that's it for you. And I went to go look at the seed package to see what it's supposed to be. Thought maybe I planted the wrong kind. The picture was what I thought it would be, but it said planted in June. So I threw some more seeds down here, and uh, hopefully they... Uh, the cooler weather and the shade from this uh, building here will keep them from bolting and they'll form those nice heads. And uh, I threw some carrot seeds down here uh, and covered it with vermiculite to keep them moist and uh, kept it watered, sprayed every day, and it came up. Uh, but they're really tight and close together, so the idea, hopefully, is to just pull out the uh, odd one here and there and let the other ones size up. But uh, Bill Morgan told me about these seeds from Bessie's that are pelleted carrot seeds. So each one is is something that you can see and hold in your fingers, whereas these things, these seeds are just like lettuce seeds, if hard to manage. So these pelleted seeds, which are coming, um, and I think it's not too late to plant carrots. Um, I think uh, 
even uh, yeah, even end of July. Somewhere in July is probably the last date you can plant carrots. Well, Linda Gilkinson calls Canada Day Carrot Day, that it's the last oh. day you can plant carrots for the rest yeah. of the season, but okay. you can actually extend that into okay. the first week or so. Yeah, well, yeah, we're on the south slope of a mountain here, so we get hotter weather and last longer maybe, so maybe we'll have luck with that. And so then, then you can plant them, you know, a couple inches apart, and you'll have big carrots. Carrots are a little bit hard to grow because you have to have well-draining soil, and it has to be soft so they don't fork fork out. And you should probably cover them in the fall to keep the rain off them because they'll split. Same with uh, potatoes. So I'll show you the uh, um, raspberries. I have these fall gold raspberries. And uh, they're doing pretty good this year. And uh, last year, they uh, I had stink bug problem. And they're li these little, uh, it was called, a, I think they call it a, sho a hard-shouldered stink bug or something. They're sort of shaped like a football player. And uh, every time I went to pick one, oh, there's one, or there's a the little nymphs or stuff, and, and, it's, and they stink like crazy. So it wasn't too pleasant. This year, there are none. So I kind of think again, it's a it's a cool spring that we had that didn't they didn't uh, propagate like usual. I haven't seen any actually this year. I have seen a lot of ladybugs though this year, a lot of ladybugs everywhere. Um, so I've got some uh, planted some seed potatoes down here. These are russets, and uh, the idea there is to uh, let them flower and die down and uh, pick them as you need them, dig them as you need them. And uh, this too, you have to cover in the fall to keep the rain off, otherwise the, uh, the uh, tubers might start sprouting in the early spring and you don't want that. To preserve the uh, uh, potatoes and also my onions, I put them in a refrigerator and uh, they'll last, uh, I don't know, six months or so that way. And I also put apples in there because um, uh, you want to keep the temperature down low, you know, down, down around maybe 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, this was a freezer, an upright freezer that that became, you know, unwieldy or it didn't, it wasn't predictable. So I changed the uh, temperature dial and got in there and messed around with the guts a little bit and uh, made it into a refrigerator from the freezer. So it uh, maintains a, a temperature that's not freezing. So that's my... Uh, solution for a, a root cellar. We bought these um, plastic raised beds off of uh, Amazon, I think it was. Uh, my wife really liked the idea and so, okay, well, I like wood, but you know, this is simple. Put them in and uh, fill them up with dirt and I decided to put squash in them. And I've got well, maybe three or four kinds of squash, uh, including the big butternut squash over there. But what I really wanted to grow, which I grew last year, were these little squashes, and they were called um, honey nut squash, and uh, they were only about this big. A few of them ripened. I had them growing over there. The summer wasn't long enough. Maybe I planted them too late. And But, boy, the taste was incredible. So I thought, okay, I'll plant them again. And this company I got them from didn't have them anymore, so I had to resurrect from some seeds that I had saved and hope that they were still good, which they were, and I got three plants out of it. But the company did have something called honey boat squash, which looked similar, same size. So I planted them in here too. So I'm hoping uh, to uh, really have a feast on those because they were about the best tasting squash I ever had. Uh, this is a Santa Rosa plum. And uh, I thought it was the best tasting plum, which is, I think it is, but it's pr there's some other ones that are pretty good too. Um, and. Uh, it's grown like crazy here. I bought it as a, a bare root thing and stuck it in there. And now it's, uh, and last year we had a lot of plums on it. And uh, what I did, and it, it needs a pollinator. So what I did, I've got a, what I did was I've got a plum tree in the other field there that blossoms at the same time as this. So I cut some uh, limb, some branches off of this with some flowers on it, stuck them in a container of water and tied it to this tree so that the bees would propagate and so they didn't have to go way over there and hopefully come back here. 
Um, didn't work so well this year, so maybe it's just taking a rest. It had too many last year. Um, so we'll see how it goes next year, but but I'm um, looking forward to this thing. Uh, you can, I've got a book too that keeps these things really small, and so I cut off the uh, leader uh, to spread it out a little bit. So, because fruit trees, uh, more often than not, will fruit on branches that are at an angle, and they won't fruit on ones going straight up. So the more you can flatten it out, the better. Some people will tie uh, a rope onto a branch and, and the other into a brick just to bring the branches down like that. So learn lots of interesting things. This is one of my Meyer lemons. And uh, it's gonna, they usually, you can almost have lemons year round on these trees because it's uh, still flowering and it's got fruit on it. So, and I've got another one in the other greenhouse. So between the two, we're never short of lemons. Um, and over here is the pomelo tree. And this is the ancestor of the grapefruit tree. I start, now this one I did start from seed. And, uh, and it, but when I read about it, it takes eight years before you get any fruit off of it. And I think we're at year seven now. I'm getting to lose count. And uh, so I've ha also had to trim it back to keep it from pushing the roof off. And uh, so hopefully uh, it, it really attracts aphids too. So I'm spraying it as well. I make a, a spray out of neem oil, uh, tobacco leaves that I extract the, the nicotine from. And uh, rue, I've got some uh, oil of rue and also growing rue. <clears throat> and uh, to kill insects. And my wife uses it on her uh, orchids and it kills the uh, little woolly aphids off really well. So that's good because orchids are really sensitive. Over here, I've got some uh, baby uh, uh, dwarf papayas. And uh, these I started from seed as well because I have one papaya tree, which I'll show you in back here, that uh, actually developed a papaya and we ate it and it tasted just exactly like a papaya. It was great, and full of seeds. So I had so many seeds, I thought, well, can't let them go to waste. <laughs> so, so now I've got a couple dozen little babies. I don't know what I'm going to do with. Well, you give one to me, Ed. Yeah, I'll yeah. good, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else watching, you want one, come and get them. <laughs> Leave a message on the YouTube thing. OK, so uh, over um, here, now you see this, uh, I don't know how we can do this. You see this pe pepper plant here. Now that is started from seed. It's barely, it's just got a little bud on it. And that's what you can expect uh, when you plant it from seed at this time of year. That's about how big they be. However, if you kept them in a warm place and kept them above five degrees centigrade in the wintertime, uh, they will survive. And they'll look like heck because the leaves will hang down and they'll turn brown in the springtime. It'll look terrible. Um, but as soon as it starts getting warm and give it water, the new leaves come out and you can take off the old leaves and you'll have a plant that looks like 100%. But on top of that, you'll have, uh, at this time of year, we've got um, fruit on them, peppers on them this big. So in another month, we'll be eating red ones, whereas these ones will just be flowering and you won't be able to eat peppers for, you know, couple months later. So if you if you got a warm place to keep them over the winter time, that's the thing to do because they're perennials actually. Okay, this this is uh, my Plumeria plant. I've got two of them and we had them indoors and they, they sort of did okay and then they lost all their leaves and then we didn't know what the heck to do with them. So I thought, so I read about them and said they needed to have a 15 degrees minimum temperature centigrade and uh, so they weren't getting that in the house. So I brought in a heater here and, and kept them at 15 degrees. Now they started to sprout out and everything. They haven't ever flowered yet. So, and I've seen plumerias that are kind of bushy. So I don't know. There, there are different kinds of plumeria, I guess. So this one, uh, if we keep it in here and keep it warm, maybe next year it'll flower, or maybe even later this year. What does it do? Is it a house plant? It's kind of a house plant. <clears throat> plumeria frangipani is another name for it. When you go to Hawaii, that smell of the flowers is this one here. They make a lays out of it, that white flower. It's really nice smelling. That's why I'm growing it. And over here is the uh, mother uh, dwarf papaya plant. And uh, like I said, it had a papaya on it last year about that big. 
And uh, this year, it's sort of taken a break. I'm trying to keep the ants off of it. Um, so uh, they like, um, it's kind of dry in here, and they like a more humid atmosphere. So every time I water, I throw some water on it and keep it happy. Same with the plumeria. Excuse me. Um, down here, um, and Friedank told, uh, talks about how great savory is, so I got some seeds and grew it, and I made a uh, curry dish last night and threw some in, and uh, it fit right in. The curry sort of overpowered it, so I'm going to try it on something else that doesn't have curry in it, but it's got a nice flavor. I'm surprised. And here I'm growing some Rosita eggplants, and that's a spit. I got some notes here on that one. Um, it's one of the most mild eggplants, and then they, they're very large. So we'll see what happens there. I've never grown them before, and the leaves are always curled, but there's no uh, bugs on them, so I don't know why that is. Uh, and these are my uh, early girl tomato plants indoors. You can see a red one there, and uh, another red one over here, you <clears throat> know, down there. So we'll have tomatoes every other day maybe. Um, now I don't know if you can see this here, but in here is a uh, grapevine uh, that I planted uh, last year. And uh, I have grapes outside, but they're darn raccoons get them all. And I've tried to uh, electrify it and everything, and, and uh, they still these things are just, they, they can get into them real easily. So no success there. So I thought, well, I'll just buy a grape plant, stick it in the greenhouse, close the doors at night, and I'll have grapes. So it looks like I'm going to be successful because these grapes are starting to cut. These are seedless grapes, and uh, so you can eat them as they are, or make juices out of them or something like raisins. that. Yeah, raisins, yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, can you see these artichokes here? This plant comes up every year. I don't do anything to it. In fact, sometimes I even mow it over after it dies back. And every year it comes up with artichokes. And my feeling is that this is a plant that we should grow a lot of here in lower BC because you go to the store at this time of year and these are $5 each. And it's an incredible price. So if a farmer get a dollar or two for each head and without hardly any work, um, this is a great product, so and it'll grow just about anywhere. Uh, they grow them down in Central California, and uh, they have uh, every year. They at least they used to have before COVID. They have an artichoke festival, and there's a hundred different ways to cook artichokes, and deep fried, and whatever, you know. So uh, a lot of people like them, and most people up here maybe don't know how to eat them or aren't familiar with them. So that's the problem. You've got to promote it as well. But I think it's worth doing. Yeah, listen up, farmers. Hmm? I just said, listen up, farmers. It's a yeah. good idea. Yeah. This is a uh, Gravenstein apple. And a friend of us, ours gave us this one plus a crab apple to pollinate it with. And every year, it comes up with lots of apples without fail. And it's one of the earliest apples, too. It even beats the transparency. So, um, and they're good in pies and fresh eating. They don't store very well, so you have to eat them all. Do something with them right away, but they're a good apple to have. And this is kind of a dwarf. I'm, I'm keeping it uh, trimmed down, and uh, instead of bending the branches down, as I mentioned before, I, on the ones going straight up, I cut off uh, about this much, and uh, so it branches out below the uh, apex, apex there and uh, makes it a little more bushy so hopefully that works i'm sort of learning about all of this stuff because trees are kind of finicky they they depend on the weather the soil the water and everybody has a different experience with them so you just have to go by what you feel like that's why i like uh reading about luther burbank because he, he he was actually the one that uh propagated the Santa Rosa plum, and uh, they say he could go into his orchard and talk to the trees. That's how he was able to say, oh, this tree will propagate, will hybridize with that one and make this. And so he was, uh, he pioneered a lot of uh, new good fruit trees. And that brings me to the fig tree.
Um, this is a fig tree that a neighbor started for me. It was, he started from a little piece, like you could take a piece of the fig tree like that much, stick it in a pot, maybe with some rooting compound, and it'll root. It's another a very vigorous plant, and that's what this was, a little stick that rooted and planted it here next to my compost, and it's gone crazy. In fact, um, my neighbor's trees, he has to use a um, ladder, a tall ladder to pick his, and I didn't want to have to do that, so after they fruit, I keep trimming them back the top parts to keep them down as much as I can. Um, so they are, I think they're ready um, in about another month. And uh, there'll be tons of apple, uh, tons, <laughs> tons of figs on this tree. And uh, I usually have to put them in egg cartons because they're very fragile. And, uh, and there's, there's about a two week uh, interval that these ripen and you've got to pick them and eat them or do something with them, dry them, freeze them, do something with them during that time. Because <clears throat> towards the end, they all start to split and the uh, wasps come after them. And so it's kind of dangerous picking them unless you get up really early in the morning or late at night. Um, but a lot of people I love figs. Said, uh, I have a brown turkey. Yeah, I think that's what this is. Yeah, my, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, and it's another tree that somebody could grow real easily, and, you know, hardly pay any attention to it at all, and have lots of figs. When I first moved here, I didn't realize figs could grow here, and I was quite surprised to see one of the house um, that we were looking at. Since then, you know, even uh, fruit trees and more has had a whole, he has 50 trees in his front yard, different varieties that he's trying out. So um, they grow really well here. So they're a good, another good thing to have in your garden. This is a, a, my dwarf avocado tree. Uh, and the first year, or after the first year after we planted it, maybe the second year, it had one avocado. So, oh, this is looking good. Since then, and that was maybe two or three years ago, nothing. It blooms like crazy, and uh, no avocados ever form. So I'm thinking uh, maybe it's time has come to pitch it and put something else in here. Um, I read about it, and um, you really probably need a, another tree to help pollinate it because it has male and female. Uh, the flower actually is male and female, and uh, but the the male. Uh, something like the male flower is open in the morning and the female is open in the evening. So, and there's a little overlap of a couple hours that something has to pollinate it to form a, an avocado. So if that's the problem, I guess uh, we're not getting uh, any avocados for that reason. So, so I've given it lots of water, given it fertilizer, given it lots of phosphorus and nothing seems to promote it. Just behind it here is a, a a grapefruit tree and it is another really uh, vigorous tree. I've had to cut it back like crazy and it just gets covered with grapefruit. It's uh, and we don't really like grapefruit so I don't know <laughs> maybe it's another one that's got to go um, but um, yeah it gets aphids too so you got to watch it and, and there's ants crawling on them. Over here is a pomegranate tree that we bought from fruit trees and more. And uh, la the first year or so, we it had flowers on it and pomegranates and everything. And last year, or this year, it didn't. It flowered, but it didn't. So uh, so what I've done this year, and it grew up kind of high, so I thought, well, I'll keep it in the bush. I'll trim it down like this and see what happens next year. It's looking really good, so maybe next year when it flowers, it will produce something but uh, pomegranates are a bit messy to eat, so we'll have to learn how to do that when we get them. I'll give you lessons. Okay, good. And uh, here I've got a uh, wasabi plant. I bought this from uh, Richter's back east, and I bought three of them because you have to buy three or four plants to get anything, <clears throat> and only one of them survived, and that was this one. But it has to be shaded, I noticed, in the uh, summertime. Uh, otherwise, it just wilts like crazy, and it needs lots of water. Over here, I'm starting some, uh, trying some starts of some different plants around here. Uh, keep them uh, in the shade, moist with water and high humidity, rather than covering them, because I figure it's hot enough that uh, the humidity should be high enough in here with the water in there. So we'll see how that experiment goes. The more I can plant, the more I can get cuttings from different things and plant them, the more fun I have. 
And uh, this is another type of lettuce that's going to seed. So I'll be dropping it down here when, it's, when it finishes. Um, this is a blood orange. And uh, I don't know what happened to it. It sort of grew out and flopped over. And my wife said, you got to do something about that. It's just growing along ground. It's supposed to grow up straight. Well, I can't find a leader in the thing anywhere. But anyway, I propped stuff up. And, and it does have three oranges on it. So I thought, well, that's worth it. Maybe it knows what it's doing. I don't know. Um, more lettuces. Now this, I mentioned though, the pawpaw tree had a relative that grew in Peru. And this is it. It's a cherimoya, and it grows the same type of fruit. Uh, they sometimes call it a custard apple for the flavor. And uh, so I'm, I don't know how old it has to be to set fruit, but this particular one is doing really well. I got the seeds from a place in California. I planted two other ones here, and, uh, and they the seeds weren't probably as viable as this one. Uh, but this one started this at springtime about two months ago it was this high so it's grown that much in the space of a month, month and a half so I'm happy about that and uh, over here is a Valencia orange tree and uh, it's you can see it's really got a lot of oranges on it probably should thin it or maybe it'll thin itself um, but um, these ones will be ripe in December approximately and uh, if we have warm weather up until then, relatively speaking, they will be a little sweeter than usual. But uh, I kind of like them. They're a little on the tart side. And you buy one in the store, and it's like full of sugar compared to these. These really have a, a little bounce to them. So um, they're really another tree really worth having in the greenhouse. And over here, we planted the, a um, lime tree. And uh, I had to cut back the orange tree and the grapefruit tree to give it some room to grow, and it's taken off now. It's flowering. And uh, we had some limes on it this year, and uh, it, um, the limes will turn yellow if you leave them on the tree. So, uh, but they taste, still taste like limes. I bought a, uh, or Lynn bought for me, my wife, bought me this little mandarin tree. And it's a seedless mandarin, and it's got mandarins on it. And uh, it's one of the sweetest mandarins there is, apparently. So I'm going to leave it in the pot for a while until it feels comfortable here, and then I'll put it in a bigger pot and uh, may even plant it in the ground here. Uh, and then another thing my wife wanted was this Seville orange because she wants to make marmalade. So, she, so you don't find these very often around here. So she lucked out and found one, so I planted it in here, and it's taken off this year really well. And uh, I'll probably have to prop it up a little better as time goes on. And uh, back behind the orange tree here is another lemon tree. This is the um, original lemon tree I had, and uh, it's still got some lemons, some lemons on it. And it's flowering. And um, this one was planted. I, uh, when I moved from another house, I, I had it in a pot. And I thought, well, now I've got a lot of room. I'll plant it outside. And, but I've got to protect it from the winter. So I built a little thing over it and didn't look at it till the springtime. Pulled the top off. And it was just black from uh, this black soot from aphids on it. So I thought, that's not going to work too well. So I thought, well, now I've got a greenhouse. I'll dig it up and plant it in my greenhouse. So I did. And this is it here. Uh, a year later, I'm, I'm out there where I dug it up, and I see a little sprig of a lemon tree coming up. I thought, oh, that's good. Maybe I got another lemon tree that I didn't, the roots were still in there. So I dug it up, put it in the other greenhouse, and that's the one you saw before. So I got two lemons for one. This is a tomatillo relative known as ashwagandha. It comes from India, and it's known as Indian ginseng uh, in, its, uh, uh, in its common name. But it's uh, written down the uh, Latin name, and it's uh, Withania salmonifera. Uh, salmonifera will give you some hint that it has medicinal qualities, and it's used in Ayurvedic medicine quite a bit. Uh, the roots, the leaves, the stem, everything. 
So it's uh, so we'll see how that does. The uh, you harvest the roots mostly, and they grow out um, in the ground like that. And it grows in Hawaii, I've seen. So um, that's why I put it here in the greenhouse to see how it'll do here. And it looks like it loves it here. So that's uh, that's an amazing little plant. I think. Uh, let's see. I'm on my list here. We covered everything you might want to know about. Yep, I think so. Well, that's it for my garden, and um, maybe at another time uh, we'll take uh, my wife's garden, take it for a ride if she's willing to get on camera, which I doubt, but we'll see. Um, but thanks for uh, watching, and I hope you learned something. I'm always learning something, so if you know something, I made a mistake, or you know something that I don't know, or somebody else wants to know, leave a comment below, and um, I'll get back to you. I read all the comments, and I answer them all. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.